be different now than what it should be in a normal time. And <clears throat> um, how does, would, would this work culture, the way you would suggest, help us build healthy, competitive, and still innovative uh, culture in the company? Let me also briefly introduce Ganesh. You already said uh, you are the CEO at Aptech Limited. He rose to become the managing director of the company. He also became global CEO of uh, Zensar uh, for many, many years. And now he has uh, become an entrepreneur. Uh, doctor, let me briefly introduce him. Dr. Ganesh Natarajan is executive chairman and founder of 5F World. Uh, <clears throat> a platform for skills, startups, and social ventures in India. The 5F World family includes his investing companies and joint ventures. Dr. Ganesh is also the founder and director of Kalzoom Advisors, a joint venture with New York-based uh, uh, JCP Inc. and Center for Artificial Intelligence and Advanced Analytics, uh, a joint venture with uh, Systex Solutions. Uh, Ganesh and I have worked, have been working together on at the NASCOM uh, board for now decades. Ganesh has also been uh, uh, chairman of uh, NASCOM earlier. If I go on on Ganesh giving his full introduction, uh, I think uh, uh, it will just go on and on. Uh, I do see some uh, uh, familiar faces here. Uh, I see Renu here, uh, and uh, I also saw Raj uh, Nair. I uh, borrowed uh, what he had shared about what his daughter calls him, um, Vibhi Nair. So Raj, I uh, read that right in the beginning, not sure when whether you were there at that time. And uh, once again, uh, most welcome to Ganesh uh, and Mark uh, for joining us. Mark, we are very eagerly waiting to listen to you on your uh, global experience of work culture and how they could help to help our startups uh, in India. So over to you, Ganesh. Sure, thank you very much, Atul. And uh, always a pleasure to, to have a chat and conversation with people at Thai Mumbai, because it's a very, very vibrant community. And of course, Raj and I also go back a very long way. So nice to see you here, Raj. And also lovely to see so many people who are ex aptech on this webinar and my most favorite human resource head of Zensar, Yogesh Padgaonkar. So thank you all for joining, very kind of you. So when we talk corporate culture, I am the last person to talk theory, as many of you know, because the first time I read up on what is corporate culture was yesterday morning, because I said, if I'm gonna speak, I better know some theory of corporate culture. But I think all the learning for me in culture has been what starts from the heart, moves through the, the soul and the spirit of the organization, and then starts affecting the brain in terms of you know, what kind of a capability do we want to build in the organization. So the way we structure this, ladies and gentlemen, is I'll maybe talk for about eight, 10 minutes on my own. I would say the discovery of what cultures work and then what is 5F world and what is the 5F culture. And then I'm gonna introduce Mark very briefly and ask Mark to talk about what he heard because Mark is based out of Melbourne, Australia. And we also work together on multiple social projects, including social venture partners, where both of us are on the global board, which is based out of Seattle. But ask Mark to comment on what he's heard, because Mark is still fairly new to India, and how does it translate to his experiences of successful global cultures? In fact, he, has, he himself has been in, involved in HR and culture for one of the largest banks in Australia. So maybe good to listen to that. And then, of course, we'll just throw it open. Any questions you have whatsoever, I love the approach of saying, ask me anything. So feel free to ask us anything. So, that's <laughs> so let me give you a little background. I mean, like all of you or most of you, I grew up in a very traditional culture. I mean, I grew up in Eastern India, finished my engineering, my industrial engineering. My first company was a very, very formal company called Crompton Greaves Limited, right there in Mumbai, in Kanjurumar. And then of course, I was based in Nasik. And Crompton has this classic Indo-British legacy. So I still remember when I joined as a junior officer in Crompton Greaves, the first thing that amused me was that given the size of your table, the length, the extent of the glass on it, and the teacup and the number of stripes of the teacup in which you were served tea, you could actually make out a person's designation, his basic salary and everything else. 
I mean, you almost predict when he would get promoted based on what tea he was served. So, very, very formal structure. There were actually four types of toilets, believe it or not. There was the there was the executive toilet, there was the manager's toilet, there was executive, staff, and of course, workmen. So it was the most hierarchical, most formal culture I have ever, and that was my first job. So I spent five years there, then ran a little startup where there was no opportunity to really, I mean, since I came from Crompton, even in my startup, my team used to call Mr. Natarajan, and I used to call them by maybe probably not Mr., but nevertheless by names. Then I had a very interesting stint for three years in NIIT, both in Mumbai and in Delhi. And there for the first time, working with a bunch of very bright NDAs, I kind of started to understand that informal cultures, you know, cultures where things got done on an entirely first name basis. And remember, we're still talking about the late 80s, so some time back, was as effective and obviously more effective than the more traditional former Mr., Miss, etc. kind of cultures. And with that, of course, Atul called me one day and there, were, there I was at the age of 34. This is 1991, actually. And there were, I was pitchforked into Aptech. And Aptech was, at that time, it was an entity called Computer Education by Apple Industries Limited. And we were a very small company. Okay? Atul is a great entrepreneur, but we were like one-tenth the size of our biggest competitor. And we were not standing out in the clutter amongst, you know, there were so many small computer training institutes all over Bombay. But we decided that, look, we've got to do something different. So we tried to assess, and Atul will remember this, that what kind of culture do we want to build? Because in the computer training industry, unlike the software industry, it was not an aspirational job. Okay, people like Lata, who's on the call today, I mean, she was very much a, a salesperson or a counselor in the Malad Center in those days. And for all of them, it was, okay, we'll do this for a couple of years, and then maybe, maybe we'll do something else. Because being a computer trainer, or working for a training company was not a great idea. So naturally, we had attrition levels of 80-90%, which means out of the 150 people we had, almost 75-80 people would be new every year. So we started with that. And we said, look, we got to crack this culture. So the first thing we did was, we called people around. And obviously, we were a struggling, just about profitable organization. And we said, look, what do we want to do to have fun in this organization? And somebody I remember gave us this wonderful story, which everybody in Aptech will remember, saying that, look, we realize we don't have enough money. We're a struggling company. But what we do have is Mr. Atul Nishar had just bought a building called Apple Heritage. If any of you know the Andheri Kurla Road in Bombay, Apple Heritage is still a, a, a building there. And we were very next to our office. And people said, look, there's a lovely rooftop that they have on Apple Heritage. So can you request your boss to give us the rooftop every Friday evening? I said, how is that going to help? He said, no, no, and, and don't give us any money. You know, just organize a bunch of biryani rice in the evening and we'll have your, you know, buy your own booze. So we'll have a beer bar set up there and we will go and get rain making machines from Film City in Goregaon, which was very close. So I said, okay, let's try it out. And I remember that first Friday when the rain started, the rain making machines started throwing out rain. It was nine o'clock and by midnight, people were so delighted. They said, look, we've got to do this every Friday. So literally for the next two years, our attrition level came down from 85% to 80%. Nobody wanted to leave Aptek because it was so much fun just to be in that Friday party. And I still remember Atul and his wife, Alka, and both their daughters used to come. And we all used to dance to Macarena and so many others. So that and the reason why we remember Reno very fondly is that her young daughter, who was probably five years old, she used to lead the Macarena dance and everybody was dancing on the terrace. So it was an amazing fun culture. Now you may say that, look, if you guys had so much fun, when did you do work? And if you look at the story of Aptek, it took us four years to catch up with the market leader, who used to be nine times our size. It took us a very little time to discover what is the DNA that we can work on. Because in those days, everybody used to say, we will run good training centers on our own, and then we will have a few franchisees, not necessarily in the big cities, in the small towns to whom we'll end up running. We changed the entire model. We said, we said our culture is going to be that we're going to focus on franchising. And even today when I talk, give lectures on franchising, the way we have franchisees feel part of our family. They used to almost tell us how marketing should be done. Our job was to actually ma maneuver that into something that we wanted to do. You would never say, this is the brand owner, this is how we have to do it, and you follow. So that flexibility was something that we really added to the fun element. And then, of course, some of us got very ambitious and we said, let's focus on at least one country outside India. We have to be there. 
And naturally, the first country was Dubai. So I remember my wife, Uma, was doing a, a year in international with Aptech. She went to Dubai and, and got a couple of people to sign up. And after that, it just flowed. The speed at which we grow, grew, I mean, both in terms of revenue, in terms of number of centers, et cetera, made us probably the fastest story in the franchise business, in the training business. That happened. All credit to Atul and the kind of free hand he gave us to experiment. And which is where, and Atul, that's, a, that's how this actually, this session also happened. Because Atul reminded me about three weeks back that remember this 5F, I thought this 5F, your company you set up, there was something called 5F even in Aptech. And I said, absolutely, Atul, you have a great memory. Because the whole concept of the 5F saying that, look, we will succeed by being fast, the first F, by being very focused on what is our business goals. At the same time, be very flexible, be willing to listen to people, whether it's franchisees, business partners, students, etc. And of course, my favorite last two Fs. So fast, focus, flexible, and friendly and fun. And building a friendly organization where there are no hierarchies. I remember I had this assistant called Roma. And only when I was leaving, she told me that, look, for the last five years, I've had something called a moodometer outside your office. That when you're in a bad mood, I change the moodometer to red. So everybody knows don't go near Ganesh. But otherwise, everybody knows that you're friendly, so they'll walk in. So it was amazing the kind of innovations we had on culture and everything else. And then when I left Aptech and joined Zensar, and Yogesh, you remember, we just took the same culture with us. And we said, let's create something where it doesn't matter. I mean, Zensar was a little 40 crore company. It doesn't deserve, deserves to exist in 2001. But even then we said, look, our focus should be only on large multinationals. We don't want to be seen as a small software company doing work only with small software. And when we grew from 40 crores to 4,000 crores, I think the DNA was still 5F. It was very, very fast growth. It was very flexible in our approach to even large customers like a Cisco or a Marks and Spencer or a Credit Suisse. And at the same time, it was a fun culture. I remember I did my advanced management in Harvard Business School in 2008. And my professor then, David Garvin, asked me that, look, I mean, you, you guys are growing so fast. What's the secret? And almost as a joke, I told him, David, it's all about love. And if you have love across 3,000 people, nothing is impossible. And David being David, I mean, he's an amazing professor. He sent his team out to Pune the next, next month. And they wrote this absolutely fabulous case study on what they call vision communities at Zensa. If any of you are interested, just give your email to Naveen. Happy to mail that to you. And that was all about how you can take a culture of love and really make it transcend across the operation. So I'll come back to what Atul said about, you know, this whole point on how do you translate stuff like love and, and areas like that into startups. And we'll come back to that as we, as we go along. But all I want to do at this point is to say that, look, there is no such formal and informal organization. It's all about, as I said earlier, what you feel from the heart. If you're a founder, you believe strongly in something, I think something called passion osmosis is important. That your passion must must transmit itself to the rest of the organization. And whatever we then have as a common agenda, whether it's our vision, our mission, our values, I think that passion will take it. So to my mind, culture comes, as I said, heart. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, it doesn't infect every person in the organization, you not manage the culture. So I want to stop here and ask Mark. Mark, maybe just a little background because you've been an HR advisor. You yourself been in human resources for a fairly long period of time. And of course, now you're a walnut farmer in Melbourne. Lucky you. So what are your, how does, how does culture transit from the stupid stories I told to what, what happens in Australia, what happens in the rest of the world? In your family? Thanks, Ganesh. A lovely story. I've, I've not heard your full story. We, I get snippets every now and again when we, when we exchange. We, we are WhatsApp friends. <laughs> so we frequently buzz each other. But actually, you know, you, you speak very, very sensibly about culture. And um, there are two things, two sayings I wanted to, to bring up. Uh, Peter Drucker, uh, a while back, said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think uh, you've absolutely illustrated through your story how culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the second one, which I thought was pretty interesting and Capra saying was what Richard Branson said about culture. He said, there is no magic formula for great company culture. The key is just to treat your stuff 
how you would like to be treated. I, I want to share with you just my, my journey through this subject and an experience in one shape or form for, for uh, five decades. Uh, and I, uh, I grew up in South Africa and I started my work life very early on when I was quite young in my father's business. Um, and uh, I, I worked in family businesses and I, so I have quite a, a strong affinity and uh, attachment to entrepreneurship. Uh, my family came, were migrants. They came from Latvia and Lithuania to South Africa. And they all started a uh, force of circumstances their own businesses. And I observed from that age what culture was successful. And I watched my father, and this is a theme that I picked up all the way through, he did something which was, you know, we had a multicultural um, workforce and everybody loved him. And I, I, I often mused why that was. And the key thing with him was he treated everyone with respect mm. uh, and treated everyone, um, you know, as if they were a friend while he was also a boss and they loved him. And um, to me, that was an important lesson. I, I worked in other family businesses. We were all in the wholesale trade. So I, I learnt, learnt uh, sales and marketing and so on. Uh, and um, I journeyed through, um, through Europe for a while and came back and did an MBA and discovered industrial relations and human relations. And I, I found my passion in uh, trying to make workplaces uh, better places. And I, 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 uh, I worked very hard uh, as, a, as an anti-apartheid activist and then left uh, South Africa disillusioned and, and came to Australia. And I've, most of my uh, early career was working for big corporates. Uh, uh, so I worked for what Wall Street are and in sales and marketing. And I had an interesting experience early on. Which, which says that it doesn't matter what you say about culture, it's what is actually transacted in the workplace. So you can have stated corporate values and you can have, have sub from one place uh, in, in ICI, which had terrific culture. And I, I asked to be moved into uh, to marketing in the explosives division and I moved to another city and uh, I was, this was, I was in my uh, late twenties then. Uh, and uh, I found that that culture didn't tolerate hard work. Uh, I came in as somebody very keen to do things and I was always busy until eventually they said, go, go and play squash, go and ride your bicycle, go and do something with your canoe. Don't basically don't rock the boat. So it's a lesson uh, that, you know, when an organization starts to get very big, being uh, relentless about watching culture is, is very, very important. I, uh, I moved from there, I actually moved to Hong Kong to work for Exxon Chemical, 14 different nationalities in the office. And it gave me a chance to observe what happens when you mix nationalities, uh, a local culture, and uh, 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 all together. But somehow, interestingly, it did work. And it had a very, very strong culture. Not a lot of what, which was stated, but um, the, the key thing, and, and Ganesh has illustrated this, that the leadership is very, very important to culture. What you say, doesn't matter so much as what you do. People watch what you do. And if we look at all the culture um, case studies that have succeeded and failed, that nexus between say and do is incredibly important. So if you're starting up an organization, um, as I eventually came around to doing, and I'll, I'll tell you about that, you, you really have to think, as Ganesh did, about what kind of culture do I want? and then relentlessly sue it and shit.
because it's very easy as it grows to have pockets that get out of control. So culture has to be largely a top-down thing, otherwise it's not going to work. You, you think of the, uh, everyone would know the Enron case study, um, that Enron just went completely off the rails um, because the culture that was tolerated from the top didn't line up with their 50 page book on corporate ethics. So again, say do is, is something that you really need to think about and be open to observation from others when you're not uh, behaving in line with what you say. It's, uh, it's so important. I can't emphasize enough. I, I moved uh, through a couple of organizations to work at ANZ Bank uh, after about 15 years in consulting, where I was consulting on corporate culture and working with CEOs. And ANZ Bank has been written up by John Cotter as the probably one of the most successful culture transformations uh, in the financial services sector. Uh, and that took a period of about seven years to change. But it, it started with some very simple but powerful concepts that the CEO put out. The biggest thing was he said, I, uh, I want to be a bank with a human face. And that was at a time when banks were very much being criticized, uh, banking um, branches were being closed, and trust was at a low level between banks and society. And unfortunately, it's come a full circle and it's back to that now. But at that time, the notion of a bank with a human face was a very, very different proposition. Uh, and the other thing which resonated with staff, so much so that we started to get uh, more unsolicited um, uh, requests for employment than we could actually ha handle. And this was an idea of uh, bring your whole self to work. So um, the notion that you can uh, be who you want to be within the work was actually very liberating to a lot of people. And there were many, uh, the, the, the CEO himself used to bring his guitar and play, play at, at work. Um, but there were many ways in which that was pushed out through the organization. But again, it re required relentless uh, pursuit of a, a number of things which um, have now been written up actually in a book by colleague of mine and at the end I want to refer you to it's the insider's guide to culture change and I think it's a very good reference book for you um, as you look at your own cultures uh, because um, the writer's name is Siobhan McHale and she identifies um, you know four important steps to culture change but in amongst that uh, she targets three key um, areas or elements of workplace culture that are the important levers for change. And they're not, the traditional ones tend to focus more on behaviors and values. And what she's illuminated, and this book has just been recently published and, and been acclaimed, <laughs> is that you've got to think about uh, what are the mental maps that people bring to it. Uh, how they see their roles and what are the, pat the patterns that get reinforced in an organization. And uh, we won't have time to go into that now, but I think uh, it is uh, a, a much better way of thinking about culture change than just focusing on individual behaviors, which are actually quite hard to change. And the, the patterns of behavior are quite well embedded. So I learned a lot from from that experience and when uh, when I um, I've, I've uh, eventually came back to running my own business uh, I came back to uh, this notion of respect about treating people with respect we're very small uh, but we do employ people and uh, it just I watched particularly my wife apply this notion of mutual respect um, that absolutely gets the best out of people. So in summary, I think um, the things I've learned and, and Ganesh has illustrated is culture comes from the top. You have to be conscious about what culture 
it doesn't, there isn't a blueprint. Uh, so it's what's the culture that is really going to um, be a competitive advantage. Uh, and you get many, you know, you can take Southwest Airlines that is a very different to a United uh, in terms of culture. And they very much focused on um, uh, servant leadership, they call it. So picking the things that you as a leader know are important, being able to articulate them, and then relentlessly pursuing that through all your symbols and your systems and making sure that you do what you say, because people will follow what you do and not what you say. So it's pretty pointless writing down your set of values and writing down the behaviors you want. That achieves you nothing. What really, what really works is the way Ganesh has described it, is relentlessly pursuing that you know will actually make the difference. So I'll stop. So Mark, can I ask you one question, which is obviously on a lot of people's sure. minds, which is, I mean, we all, I mean, in social venture partners, we are all led to the concept of equity in the world. In the US, we've seen the George Floyd issues over the last two and a half weeks. And even in the US and in many parts where there are equity issues, I mean, the US has already always been saying, okay, black lives matter and everything else. So why is there such a dissonance in America between what they say and what they do? Any thoughts on that? Sorry to put you on the spot. Worries me. <laughs> no, I think that's a really good question. And I've worked for American companies for a lot of my career and I've been going in and out of the US. And interestingly, um, it hasn't always been very visible. And that is one of the things about culture and norms is that they're not always very visible. Uh, and you have to dig down and see what the patterns are. Um, I think that uh, there's a very strong uh, um, po portion of the population, call them the Trump supporters, who um, actually like things the way they are. And um, in their minds, to, to deal with this issue means giving something up. And so there's a, there's a big conflict between those that want more equity, power sharing and justice, and those pretty happy with the way things are and don't want to change. And so, you know, it's been going on for 400 years. Uh, I, I personally believe, and I know you do, Ganesh, also, is the best chance we've got is with the youth. Is, and, and I saw that in South Africa too, that where the change occurred, was when young people said, no, we, we, don't, we don't buy this. We want this to change. And, uh, and I think we're seeing that with the climate movement. Uh, and I think we'll see that here. And that's where I believe the best investment uh, can be made. And certainly within corporate cultures, um, the change can be made if, uh, if the right sort of... Um, emphasis is made but it it's big it's very big i know in fact we are all struggling with that and i totally agree with you that even in india where we have all kinds of issues communities and class and caste and everything else i think it's the young people who will come up and say you know why does this matter i think that's probably when real change will happen i'll just answer a couple of questions i saw and then i'll hand it over to naveen sure that the first one, of course, somebody said, what's the fifth F? I thought I said it, but nevertheless. Fast, <laughs> focused, flexible, friendly, and fun. Because for me, the last F is most important. And I still remember, and many of my friends here from Zensar will remember, every month we used to have an induction for young people. And we used to tell them that, look, the day you get into the company bus and on a Monday morning and say, oh my God, the weekend is over. Again, I have to go back to work. You should quit. And we used to promise them that, look, the day you stop having fun in the company is the day you've got to move out. Because a person not having fun goes around with this very morose face. It's kind of infecting. It's worse than coronavirus. You're infecting your dismal <laughs> mood to 10 people and they will go and say the same thing. So we said, look, everybody has to have fun. So fun is extremely important. And I mean, somebody said, so is that what 5F World is? Yeah, absolutely. And when we set up 5F World in 2016, we said we will approach it not from the classical investor lens, but we will go and invest in companies which will take this value of, you know, very focused on digital technology, wanting to change the world, 
the fast approach and the invest in growth. So today, out of about nine companies that we've invested in, surprisingly or not so surprisingly, eight of the nine have women CEOs. I think they embody the culture extremely well. But I mean, if you look at it, I mean, two and a half weeks back, there was this uh, notice in Pune that you know you can start working in private companies. Nobody was very sure whether it's only applicable to IT and IT enabled services. Who's it valid for? And the first thing I got, a, I was getting a call from all our CEOs saying, we want to get back to work. And I remember calling up the commissioner's office and be allowed to go to work. So the commissioner said, don't, so long, don't, so long as you don't ask the question, do whatever you want. We know you guys will be responsible. So I'm saying people are, what I like about even 5F world is because of this 5F culture, people are very empowered. They take their own decisions. If I don't show up in office for a month, nobody will miss me. I just, I just tell myself I'm important enough and I have to add value. But I think that culture is really works when independently, I think everybody goes on to make that happen. Just one last point on startups. I think startups obviously have to be very, very focused. Today, there is this lovely word that has been introduced in the lexicon called pivot. So even if we change our mind after one year, they said we're just pivoting our model. But at the end of the day, we have to be clear on our goals and what we want to achieve. And if you do that fast, you are able to look at changes in the marketplace and be flexible enough, like a lot of ed tech and health tech companies are doing. I think you can be very smart. Mark rightly said, doing is the most important. So if you're able to do, demonstrate by action and not by talk, that this is the culture, this is the way we want to work, nobody can stop you. So I'm going to... And Ganesh, are, you, are your people quite happy to tell you when you step out of line? I, I, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely because that that's a tough one no, being yeah, open, being, being no, absolutely. I mean you you met one of my young colleagues Ipsita many times I mean there's nothing that she will not say she feels strongly about which is I think the culture behind it. Naveen any favorite questions of yours that you yeah so let me uh, start um, yes. uh, Ganesh uh, some questions uh, that I've received from uh, different participants uh, so one question is, how do you manage a culture in the company when you have differences in terms of age, your millennials versus the older people, well experienced, so wise versus youth. Secondly, also MBAs versus non-MBAs, you have some who are highly qualified uh, and some who are not, but they have uh, done a great work and learned over a period of time out of experience. So how do you handle these two sets of uh, people and aspirations uh, in terms of managing harmony and still taking company forward to its goal? I think it's an interesting question and I'm going to throw it back to Bark also. But I mean, I'll give you a, like, like as you know, I always do, I'll give you a real story. <coughs> when I moved, Aptek, we had built a fairly homogeneous culture, we worked together for 10 years and everybody knew this is the culture. When I'm this company with a, I don't know how many of you are aware, it was started off in Pune in 1922 as a British tabulator machine manufacturing company. So there were people with a very long culture who had spent 20 years already in the old organization, which then became Zensar. And there were a bunch of brand new guys. So I remember after about six months, we realized, as you rightly pointed out, Atul, this, there was a lot of dissonance between the new people wanting to be successful fast and the older. I remember one very senior person who said, I have one philosophy. I will never do a project which the company has not done before. And I said, we're a little company. If we never do a project we've not done before, we'll stay in the same place. This is like what uh, Ms. Narayan Murthy famously says, that look, the safest place for a ship to be is in the harbor, but then it'll never get anywhere. Okay, so that, so then we, did a full offsite and we, we brought in all the aggression, all the culture, all the openness. And to Mark's point, you know, some people actually asked me a lot of tough questions. And I remember at the end of the first day, my human resource head was a very, very senior person. He had come from Coca-Cola, RJR, Navisco, very proper HR person. He called me to the side and said, look, Ganesh, I don't think this is the way we can run this office. You're being too informal. People are challenging you all the time. This is the way we run this company. And I want them to come and challenge you also. I mean, don't take your VPHR designation and get people not to challenge you. So it created a bit of a catharsis 
But then uh, quite a few senior people said, this is what we want. We want growth. We want success. Quite a few junior people were shocked because they never experienced something like this. But I found that very quickly, people kind of moved towards a mean saying, okay, either, either I like, either I hate the culture, so I must get out. Like in, even in the Harvard case, uh, Professor David Garland writes that, look, 30% of people in Zensa completely got the culture. But this is what they wanted to do in life and they would never go, which is why my team, nobody quit for the entire 15 years. And about 60% don't quite get the culture, but they like it. They think, oh, it's doing well for the company. It's doing well for people. My teams are happy. And 10% hate it. So those 10% who are completely from a different planet, they'll say, oh, this is not the culture I want. And they'll be looking out and they'll go. So I think the, you have to let a few people go because they might disrupt the culture. But you've got to make sure that you're able to carry the high performers. I don't know, Mark, do you have any views on I mean, how do you... Yeah, how- sure. I, I go back to my ANZ experience, and this was very interesting. One of the, the core things we discovered was that uh, if, you, if you deal with points of view, you get a lot of conflict. If you build relationships and understanding, then the rest sort of follows. So we embarked on a very long program. Uh, thousands of people went through. It was called Breakout. But it was largely about relationships and improving interaction quality. And so people got to share what were their deepest fears, what were their hopes, what drives them, how do they think. Uh, And through that process, people got to appreciate what others were bringing. And that whole divide between young and old, uh, traditional and not, just seemed to melt away as people started to hear others talk and say, Gee, I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't appreciated that. I didn't realize that person bring... So bringing your whole self to work, uh, what we found was that there are many people who perhaps in the past weren't enjoying work, but were doing huge things outside of work and were playing leadership roles in community, but no one ever knew. And suddenly you see people through different eyes. So there is something very key about improving the interaction quality, which actually helps bridge those sorts of gaps. So Mark, there is a question for you. Uh, What are the new trends in this uh, area uh, that we in India as startups need to learn? Uh, But please do keep in mind that we are uh, relatively smaller companies and want to learn from global trends? Yep, yep. I'm going to refer back to this, uh, this fabulous book that's just come out because I think uh, it, it captures all of the current thinking. And to me, it transcends cultures, uh, uh, country cultures. Uh, and it would be a very good guide for, for the participants to have a look so uh, I'll just go back. It, it, um, it proposes that uh, there's a, um, a process for um, either disrupting or establishing a culture uh, and that the key elements are the things that really you need to pay attention to, which is a somewhat of a departure from the more traditional view of vision and values and behaviours. So it goes more into what are the mental maps that people bring? So where, where, you know, how do they think about things? Uh, what roles do they see they, themselves in? And by changing people's roles, you can actually change their behaviors. And what are the patterns that seem to recur over and over again, which are holding people back? And so it asks you as a leader to be a bit of a diagnostician and to really diagnose what's going on to then reframe things in the way you want to break the old patterns and then to consolidate and grow so you know i think that the new thinking really is a departure from and really all i was taught about tackling behaviors because they're quite hard to change whereas changing people's roles helping them develop different mindsets and changing the patterns 
that are the norms in an organization if you're coming in or if you're starting up establishing patterns of how things get done to me actually brings a new dimension that um, I think is very worth while looking at. So at, uh, I, I will center to the, um, the book title. It's available as an ebook. It's a really easy read. And I think you will find it really helpful. Um, and maybe another time, if you want, I'm sure I can get my friend to come and talk to us about how you execute on that. So Ganesh, there's a question. Um... Uh, in a company, how do you build culture among the senior management team when it is known that the uh, promoter's son or daughter will come and take over the business, <laughs> uh, which is there in India. I mean, it's a, a fact of life. So how do you take that factor into account uh, while building the work culture? <clears throat> well, it's a very interesting question because, uh, I mean, I think it crosses the minds of many professional CEOs. In fact, even if you look at the newspapers of yesterday, I was talking to my friend Vivek Gambhir, who was the Goodrich uh, Consumer Product CEO. And Years that oh my god I'm, I'm not continuing so many great things could have happened so all the three five year terms I did you know here term one term two three three we had specific agendas we got the team fully aligned and obviously if you did well the board you to continue and of course as you you know head member but I think you have to be conscious of the fact that you don't have a lifetime to make this change happen. In the U.S., this issue would never come up because CEO terms are typically not more than three years. I mean, <laughs> you, have real, you have to be a real exception, a John Chambers, yeah. for such a long time. And even John Chambers had to go at one, some point of time. So I think yeah. you need to plan for the short term. In fact, somebody has asked that question saying that, look, uh, I mean, in a, in a company where mentoring, etc. works, maybe it's services, it works. But I think somebody has said, look, in an insurance company where sales is the only thing, how do you create this culture? I mean, I'll give you the example of my very good friend in Pune, Mr. Tapan Singhal. And if you look at the way Tapan runs Bajaj General Insurance, it is as heart-oriented and as people-oriented as I would ever have done. So, which is why he's a very good friend of mine. Of course, Tapan also is a strong personality. I mean, his, his most famous quote within Bajaj Insurance, and if you talk to anybody in Tajik, they'll tell you that, is that, look, I mean, I, I don't know how to translate. He has a wonderful Hindi statement, which I'll say and then try and translate. He, and his, his point is, you know, in every group, there is one gunda. Ho sakta hai. Or his company ka gunda mein. What it means, Mark, is yeah. I just I just want to I want to pick up on the uh, on the the sort of the family ownership thing. I've done a lot of consulting work with family really? organizations, particularly those that have grown a bit. And where I think the the ones that have done well have become very clear about family versus management and have essentially created a two-tier model uh, where family have a voice but not in relation to the management of the organization and that helps the professional managers is really worth thinking through is how those relationships work. I would like to add... Uh... Actually, if I can interrupt, I mean, this is exactly where your greatness comes through and I'm not trying to flatter you. If you'll, you'll recall that, you know, I have this, I'm a stickler for punctuality. If a meeting has to start at 9, I will not let it start at 9.01. So it's been a, I mean, maybe almost a fetish for me. And I remember Atul, I mean, when Atul used to come for our meetings, he would always be on time. And he used to joke about it saying, oh my God, this is Ganesh's meeting. I know it will start on time, so I'll be on time. Now, that's such a wonderful gesture. I mean, I've seen in my consulting career in the last three years, I mean, 
mean, there are promoters of very small companies who believe that they can land up at 11 o'clock and let the management team do whatever. Now, that sets a bad example. So I'm saying if both the promoter and the promoter's family and the CEO are aligned on certain basic core values, I think it can be a very hard one. So I think it's probably... So what I would like to add here from my own experience, of course, both my listed companies, Aptech and Hexaware, uh, at no point of time, uh, any of my daughters came and took over, nor was that the plan. From beginning to end, it was always planned to run professionally. But also the point can come between a professional and uh, the promoter or the owner. Uh, I think the way to address that, uh, apart from the empowerment that one gives to the professional team, also equally important is also in some form of uh, sharing of upside. I think that's quite important. You know, if, if company builds value, company grows, some sharing has to be there with the management team. I firmly believed in that. And uh, <clears throat> in my career, I've implemented that in an increasing manner. That is very important that we share the benefit of the upside so that the team does not feel they're working yes. for somebody else. They are also working for themselves. I think that and the empowerment that is given to the team to take decisions, even if sometimes they may go wrong, is, uh, is a very critical thing in, in uh, making team feel that it, it is not that they are working for somebody else absolutely yep yep i agree it's one of the big levers i think uh yeah uh then also the since our large number of participants today are our um, uh, startups the question is how do we attract uh, talent for early stage startups which is so difficult well, it's an interesting point. And I mean, all the startups we are working with. First, of course, I mean, the all-knowing entrepreneur who has only little minions working for him never succeeds. So you must have at least two or three people of equal competence in your founding team, which I'm sure most of you have looked at. Because very rarely one, I mean, not everybody is a Jack Welch and you can't really run a corporation by yourself. And after that, I think it's the culture you set up. I mean, as Atul already alluded to, uh, sweat equity and stock option plans. I mean, if you're generous with equity, you're able to get people who will work not just for salary, but also for ownership and value creation over a period of time. I think that's that's going to be very important. And I think both Atul and Harsh Goenka, who was my founder and chairman in, uh, in, in, R, in Zensa, RPG Group, I think they've been very generous from that point of view, saying that, look, let the team feel empowered. So I think you'll have to pay not just the CEO. I mean, you may be the CEO yourself as a founder. But at least six, seven people who run it like their own business and don't have to be cajoled to come to office after a, after a lockdown, but they are themselves kind of driven and make things happen. But I think getting that drive and making sure that you hire at least two or three people who feel it, once you have five or six people who really talk positively about the company, then it becomes more of how do you say no to people. But getting those first two people, please address your culture. Somebody was asking the question on the chat saying that, look, how do you, do you change culture or uh, do you adapt to it? So, look, I mean, if you are in charge of developing an organization, you have to set the cultural tone. Okay, and there's no changing the culture. I mean, there may be a change required, but I'm saying be very clear on what culture you are. So once a culture is established, you can attract the right people towards that culture. And once you attract a few right people, it'll just expand. That's been my experience throughout my 35 years. I don't think that changes. Um, I also want to acknowledge the presence of a uh, lot of uh, Eptekites uh, who are here today, uh, from Gopal to Mahesh Ranka, Renu, Atulya Joshi, Dilip, Kitiara. Um, they've sent uh, messages to me uh, saying hi, so I just want to acknowledge all of them. Raj Nair uh, also. Uh, we work together on Thai Mumbai board. We work together on Indian Merchants Chamber board. Uh, he's himself an eminent management consultant. Uh, we have had super successful seminars uh, that he has conducted. 
uh, and with huge response and we want him to do it again. So on uh, account of public demand, just as Ganesh is here for the second time, uh, uh, so I want to acknowledge um, all of them and as um, uh, Ganesh's colleague Yogesh uh, Padgaonkar also of Zensar, so nice to see the old uh, colleagues uh, uh, here present, which also <clears throat> is a testimony of uh, Ganesh's record. You know, when you have so many people who you work with in past and still uh, have that belief in uh, wanting to meet you and listen to you is yeah. uh, is a great endorsement. Do you agree, Mark? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, no, no, I have no doubt about that. So I, can see, I can see from his following on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, another question is on transition plan. Now, the CEO is working, continuing, not just CEO, any departmental head. And uh, in India, particularly, I've seen, I don't know, Mark, your experience. But when, it, when we talk of transition plan in the sense, um, succession plan, okay, let me use a better word, sorry, not transition yes. plan, succession plan is the more appropriate word. Now, succession plan doesn't mean you want to throw that uh, CEO or a business head out of the company. You want that person to continue, but there are so many contingencies that can happen in life that you just want to no, if person is not there tomorrow for whatever reason of uh, whatever it may be for whatever length of period and uh, then who takes over and is there a plan to really induct someone else who can uh, uh, take over that role if not permanently at least temporarily for a month to three months type of scenario. So, but people get very touchy about it. How does one handle this? I mean, if you are a CEO, how do you handle other people? If you say, look, I mean, if you're not there, who else can do your role? And then guy, that person feels insecure. It's, oh my God, I'm gone, you know? You, you know, that's, that's an interesting one. And I, I can talk about the big organizations Please, yeah. have, made, have made it a measure of the CEO's performance is to say, we are going to measure you on how well you develop successes uh, to your role. And, uh, and, and they'll be very clear about that. And the board will get very involved in meeting all of the potential successes and make it quite an open process. Uh, so, you know, that is one way of doing it. Um, to, but make the CEO accountable for his or her own succession, I think is a really, really good way to drive it. Because if you leave it to the CEO, some will want to stay. And maybe the timing shouldn't be their choice. Uh, so I, I, think, I think that's a, a challenging but successful strategy. Uh. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then um, another question is, how does Ganesh, your formula of uh, 5F work with the new trend of working out of home? And a lot of companies are even talking about uh, giving up the office space. So how does one implement uh, uh, this as such? So it's a good question and let me tell you, how and also my personal view on this whole, everybody working from home. I mean, even in there, in today, 40% of my life is in the social sector. And apart from social venture partners, which Mark and I are both part of, we have Pune City Connect, which is one of the most successful public-private partnership NGOs in the country. And there, I mean, people have been working from home and these are very young people, first job, many of them, and almost like out of the 55 people, we used to do a daily call, literally 9.30 to 10.15, sharing stories, sometimes singing songs, etc. So the bonding was tremendous. But I think the point I'm making is I am not a great fan of everybody working from home forever, especially for India. And the reason I'm saying this is, don't forget that, let's say, 
I don't have screen tape. out of 43 lakh people in the Indian IT sector, if 35 lakh people start working from home on a permanent basis, typically it creates two and a half times the number of jobs. So you're talking about one crore people in transportation, hospitality, healthcare, not to talk about pubs and restaurants who might be out of a job. A. And B, and this is a webinar we were doing for the Rotary Club some time back. How do we know that if, let's say, and I'm just taking one gender, if let's say if the man in the family stops going to work and it's a little two bedroom apartment in Borivili in Bombay and one, one room throughout the day is now occupied by the man and he says, keep quiet and give me coffee whenever I want. And he has parents staying at home, children staying at home. You're going to destroy the family. So I am not a fan of everybody working from home. There is a value to office culture. There is a value to meeting people. So long as it's required for people to work from home, great. But should we then say that, look, every company should now sell off its offices, get out the real estate and get people to work from home? I don't think so. There are reasons why workplaces were created. And there are yeah. good psychological reasons for that also. Creativity and uh, collaboration are really important. Absolutely. You know, somebody uh, on another webinar asked a very interesting question. Uh, they said, if productivity, uh, according to some measures, productivity is improved that pe now people are working from home. The question is, what have we not been doing at work, which we should be doing, which would enable that productivity to be higher in the workplace? And maybe there's some lessons we've learned from all of this that we can bring back into the workplace uh, to, to make things uh, go better for people. Yeah, absolutely. So when when the employees go back to work now after uh, being away for so long from uh, work, how do organizations handle that? So they just have to come back. <laughs> I, have a very young, I have a very young person who's not more than what twenty six years old. And he's been saying, oh my God, it might be dangerous. My parents are saying, don't go to work. And his, his immediate boss had a, I mean, sorry to oh, a very direct chat with him saying that, look, you've designed this office for people working collaboratively. If you feel that that doesn't work for you, please resign. <laughs> it, may sound brutal, it may sound brutal, but you can't now suddenly make it like, you know, anybody does whatever they feel like. So you have to be firm. You have to be nice. If there's a genuine issue, by all means, I mean, right now, of course, two thirds of our people are still working from home because, I mean, that's the norm. I mean, there is social distancing required, etc. People have to be safe, but it shouldn't happen that people now say that, look, I'm very happy working from home. I don't want the commute. Sorry, we have to get back to work. We have to build this country. We don't have choices. Well, thank you, Atul. It's been, it's been a pleasure for both Mark and me to have this conversation. And thank you for all the people who are posting yeah. complimentary questions and comments on the chat. And anybody who wants to get in touch with us, feel free. Naveen can give you our mailings. I mean, give, give you our emails. Not a problem. Yeah. So great. I think the questions are uh, unending. There are so many more questions. Uh, um, sorry, we are not able to address all the questions. Uh, but what we will do uh, at Thai, we will compile all the questions uh, so that uh, any participant who's sending the question, the effort will not go in waste. And we will direct them uh, to Ganesh and Mark so that we will obtain the response and we will uh, circulate to uh, the respective people. Is that okay, uh, Ganesh and Mark? Oh, absolutely. Delighted to continue the interaction. Yeah, so we will uh, 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 collect uh, collect the questions and take them forward. Naveen, so we can uh, uh, do that uh, as forward. And I want to thank uh, both you, Mark and Ganesh, uh, for joining us. I also want to thank each and every participant who, who joined us and a lot of familiar faces, a lot of uh, old eptekites and uh, known people. So... Uh, wonderful to have you all here and reconnect with uh, uh, with all of you. And please continue to join all the events, programs, webinars, seminars of uh, Thai Mumbai. We'll bring to you a lot more events and we want to be of support to you during this uh, uh, trying time that we are all going through. 
uh, unitedly as the whole world. So keep um, keep confidence, keep going, do well in your work, business, and take care of personal health and your family. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.